The, the film was actually a result of a project that we started geared for law enforcement. The original effort was this group of people who sat around the table, and when we heard that story, we kind of looked at each other and went, boy, if the officers heard this, I wouldn't get any more of those questions about, well, why doesn't she just leave, or how many times do I have to go back to this house? The officers would have better understanding how important their role is in the fight against domestic violence. And so from a law enforcement perspective, the idea is that at some point we have to recognize we can't do this alone. So the 111 number that you've been hearing all night um, is, a, is a, a very determined effort on our part to capture these stories. But, but the report will also reflect that in Texas in 2009, our youngest victim was 13 years old who was killed by her boyfriend. And our eldest victim was 83 years old who was murdered by her husband. So the coordinated community response isn't just these components of a, of a society. It is each and every one of us. And I guarantee you, we outnumber the bad guys. No doubt, we outnumber the bad guys. We just need to work collectively, intelligently. We need to model that behavior in our own families and our own homes. I have a 10-year-old daughter, and I will use every breath that I have to make sure that she is not a 13-year-old victim. These cases are so complex. I mean, if you ever think about it, in a domestic violence case, the victim and the offender know each other, and they will continue to know each other in almost every case. That's what makes them so hard for prosecutors. After we've contacted the victims, and that usually is in the morning, then we review the cases. And we review the cases from uh, listening to, going over the report, going over photographs, finding out, looking at his criminal history, we get his booking sheet, we get to look at his picture because with technology now I can get all those records on, on the, through the computer. Then we listen to the 911 call, then we listen to what she says because we've been out to her home. We either contact her in person or by phone. And in two years there's only one victim we've not contacted. We do all of that and then we make a decision, we make a recommendation as to what we should do with the case. And the reason we do that is because we contact her so quickly and because we review the case so quickly, we believe that the case is ready for prosecution right after that meeting. We are set. And we change the culture in the office so that now these cases are of high importance. Um, we, we, we do our very best to prosecute each case. We, don't, we aren't always successful. But I can tell you that we hold the defendant, the offender, more accountable because we have closed the gap in which it takes us to process the case. And because we've been in touch with her, she now knows how to reach us at a minimum. And so we've been, had some real success. And I'd like to think that we're making a difference uh, because we get there so quickly. Yes, hi, thank you. My name is Grace Davis and um, started my career off as a social worker as a volunteer in the domestic violence shelter in San Marcos, Texas. My question to Verizon and to you, sir, is how proactive are you in the training of your new employees as they walk into your business, into your company, in understanding domestic violence and sexual violence that occurs? I think that the, the company showed as much flexibility as it could at the time in dealing with Amy and some of the needs that she had for her family. I mean, can you imagine having uh, a spouse calling the office every 10 or 15 minutes in a work situation and tying up your employees and your phone line and taking people away from customers and yet you know Amy didn't lose her job so I think that we in our wireless unit are fairly sensitive but I will also admit that I think we've got some other things that we can do with the rest of our business units in educating our employees about what they can do in supporting employees we do offer employee assistance and a 1-800 number for employees to call for anonymous uh, consultation. So that's all something that we offer for employees, not just for domestic violence, but for other types of issues, mental health, alcoholism, things like that. Uh, but I do think that we can do a better job of educating other parts of our workforce about this issue. Yes, it's ugly. Yes, it's hard to talk about. But, you know, being silent about it hasn't worked the last several decades. I think most people don't just discuss domestic violence at all. It's not the kind of crime that we talk about. So it really is uh, seeing something like Amy's story, 
or keeping the discussion going as difficult as it is. Because I think uh, we've made great strides in the domestic violence area, but I think we have a long ways to go. So until we actually discuss this crime really openly, like we do, for instance, DWI, where we think that's just a horrendous crime, then we won't really move anywhere. And that's really what elected officials need to start doing. They need to start discussing this crime and make it much more public. What can we do to challenge your competitors uh, to do the same? I think part of it is you have to try to get creative. Our Hope Line project, where we recondition phones that people turn in to us. We have boxes in all our Verizon wireless stores where if you've got cell phones sitting around your house that you don't need anymore, take them to a Verizon wireless store. We recondition those phones and we donate them to uh, domestic violence shelters. Since 2001, we've donated over 7 million cell phones to domestic shelters across the country. My name is Gwyneth Jett, and I'm an overcomer of domestic violence. Overcoming is kind of a word that many of us that are survivors are using because we don't want to just be survivors, we want to keep going. Um, a couple of things that have occurred to me this evening is, especially with Verizon, I think that when the police were called and when I was in the police station or the hospital, if somebody had said, here, here's a new cell phone, swap it. Because that same experience with the constant calls and the text messages, um, you know, if I could have ditched my phone and still kept in contact with my children, I would have done that. Well, my name's Jill Meyer, and I'm 14 years old. And um, so my question for y'all is, um, the people in my hometown, Dripping Springs, want the adults to vote for them to be the police or sheriff, whatever they are, when I know from experience that some of them don't really care about domestic violence. I want to know what is a way that I could spread the word to them and make them more aware of domestic violence and how to take care of it better. Well, one of the things that would be a, a great starting point, point for you would be to try to find somebody that is doing this work because there's a lot of people in this room and at the countywide level and the statewide level who are doing this work and that's who you need to find as your big partner. And so you find a partner who is doing this, whether it's an advocate, whether it's a prosecutor, whether it's a police officer, you find somebody who is making a difference already, and then you get your story told. And you tell that person what you experienced and what was going on and what the response was, and see if you can start affecting change based on that real live experience, just like we're doing with Amy's story. The reason we're telling Amy's story is so that mechanisms all across the United States start to change. And maybe it's an idea of you know, getting that Telling Amy Story video and stick it in somebody's mailbox and say, hey, by the way, this is what happens when you don't respond to domestic violence in your community. But you need to find a strong partner. You need to find somebody who is doing this work already, and they are out there, and they do exist. Candidates are often the most accessible when they're running for office. Um, <laughs> after they get elected, they're sometimes harder to find. And so take that partner and use it as an opportunity to figure out which candidates are the one that if they are elected will be the most important and make sure somebody's at the forums to ask them questions and make sure that when the newspaper asks them questions in the editorial board meetings that somebody has suggested that the newspaper should raise the issue because the more the issue gets raised and when they're campaigning the more likely it's going to be that they'll have sensitivity to the issue after they get elected and particularly when it comes from somebody who can ask the question as strongly as you can.